This is Breathe California TV. Uh, each week for the last 30 years, we've run a program called Environmental Concerns to um, focus on ways to prevent lung damage. Um, if you go to Breathe California's office in the Willow Glen area of San Jose, we have flyers to help you cope with any of 13 different lung diseases, including COVID and in about 20 different languages. Um, so today we're gonna to be talking, talking with Arthur Bienstock about science policy. Um, may not even occur to some of you that that's something that we need to manage as a country, but um, Dr. Bienstock has been in both the um, Clinton and the Obama administrations to um, work on that very topic. And we're gonna talk to him a little bit more about areas like how do we get more uh, scientists and high tech people um, trained and working in our lives. So be back and join us in about 30 seconds. My name is Renee Montez. I've been using the CPAP machine, I would guess, uh, 10 years. I, I got so accustomed to it, I don't uh, go anywhere without it. I take it with me everywhere. From the moment I put it on, um, I thought it was the greatest thing because the breathing was a lot easier. And uh, I, after using it for a couple nights, I felt uh, a lot of energy. Breathe California is fabulous. <laughs> Welcome back. I'm Terry Trumbull, a volunteer for Breathe California. Um, if you're interested in the things that we're talking about today, we sure could use your help. So just call 408-998-5865 and we'd be happy to have you come help us. So our guest today is Arthur Bienstock and you see a picture of Stanford University behind him. Uh, you're a professor emeritus there. I am. Uh, I retired a little over a decade ago, but I continue to work with the university on a part-time basis. Are you a little confused about the concept of retirement? No, I, I think it's something <laughs> that you take in moderation. Uh, well, um, I retired two years ago after teaching for 25 years with having none of the research obligations that you did. And, it hasn't stopped me from doing this show or three other nonprofits that I think are pretty important. So we appreciate your continued engagement. So um, tell us a little bit about your uh, background. One of the world's greatest experts on photons and somehow or other you've turned that into a science policy expert. Well, you know, I came to Stanford as a professor, uh, uh, to teach and do research in applied physics and material science. Um, uh, five years after I arrived, I was appointed vice provost for faculty affairs and faculty affirmative action officer, but continued to do my research on basically the physics and structure of solids. Uh, then uh, a group of us undertook to get extremely intense x-rays from an, an accelerator up at SLAC National Accelerator Lab. Uh, at the time, they were uh, about 100,000 times as intense as an x-ray tube, and they've gotten more and more intense as time went on. I led that facility for 19 years and it just got bigger and bigger and that meant that I was engaged first with the National Science Foundation and Department of Energy officials, then with the Office of Management and Budget and the Office of Science and Technology Policy and Congress, all related to this facility, which is a user facility and had people, about a thousand users coming from around the world. And that just got me more and more involved in policy. 
uh, I decided after serving 19 years that I was going to step down, go back to research, teaching, and skiing. And uh, I got a call from the White House one day saying, can you come to Washington tomorrow? So I got on a plane the next day, went to Washington, met with the president's science advisor. And uh, we met in my um, a uh, motel room near uh, Dulles Airport. And after about two or three hours, they offered me the position of associate director of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. About five months later, I was confirmed by the Senate and went off to Washington for three and a quarter years of what was probably the most exciting and interesting of the various jobs I've had, <coughs> although all of them have been interesting. Um, at the end of that time, I came back to Stanford. For a while, I was vice provost and dean of research, uh, and then uh, we stepped down from that, and then in, I think, 2012, Obama appointed me to the National Science Board. And only last week, I attended my last meeting virtually of that board. So that's the story. Well, it's very impressive commitment to public service. Um, talk a little bit more about it. What do you feel like your accomplishments have been? on that uh, board? Oh, uh, probably the earliest accomplishment was trying to get the government to systematically reduce the amount of time that researchers spend on the administration of their federally funded research. Uh, several surveys <coughs> indicated that uh, scientists were spending about 42% of their federally funded research time on administration rather than on the science itself. And that process has continued. We issued a report on the National Science Board and uh, that process has continued. In recent years, I have been concerned as I was at OSTP on the future of our science and technology workforce. Uh, in particular, something that hasn't been discussed that much is the financial barriers that American youth face uh, before they get to graduate school that makes it really almost, but not quite impossible for students from the lower economic strata to go on to graduate school and continue contribute to science and technology uh, at an advanced level. Uh, so I'm assuming, I apologize for the interruption, Arthur, that student loans are a big part of what you're talking about there. Student loans are a very big part of it. Uh, the National Center for Science and Engineering Statistics has published data that indicate that those who actually get PhDs, young American youth, have considerably less student debt than the average. So, and, and that student debt arises because there's been a change in America's attitude towards higher education. When our public universities were established via the land grant, there was a strong feeling in Congress and in the government in general and in the states that it was vital to the whole population that we educate people in what were called agriculture and the mechanical arts. And that belief persisted through, I'd say, the early decades after the Second World War. More and more the states who support public ed higher education have come to think of that education as a private good rather than a public good. And tuitions at public universities have gone up 
markedly because of reduced state support. We've got to turn that around if we're going to have the science and technology workforce we need. So uh, what about private universities like Stanford? I'm uh, probably uh, un uninformed and you can help me here, but I got two uh, graduate degrees in Washington, D.C. at two private schools. And uh, in going there from 1967 to 73, I paid 2,500 a year in tuition. My um, daughter graduated from Santa Clara in 2007. And her last year, she was paying 45,000 a year. I haven't calculated out the um, cost of living increases there, but I'm guessing that the um, cost of four-year colleges has gone up more than inflation. The, the Stanford's tuition is very high. I don't remember what it is at the moment, but there's another factor you really have to take into account. And that is that Stanford meets the financial need of every student that it admits, and it admits on a needs blind basis. And of that financial aid, only something of the order of 5% is student loans for the undergraduates. We, we try to do it all with either pure scholarships or work, uh, recognizing that student loans are a barrier to our students going on to graduate school or professional school. The same is true of other uh, highly endowed private universities. Um, on the other hand, a lot of private universities just don't have the endowments and the gifts to do that. And tuition is a real barrier in student loans to the students going on. And that hurts our workforce, seriously. It's part of the reason that we're so very dependent on immigrants from China, India, and the rest of the world to supplement our domestic supply. Yeah, it's amazing how critical that is. I had a young woman who um, helped me put on this show for a number of years and her husband was from Bangalore, India, and uh, was critical part for Intel and um, getting um, more and more data on the chips. Um, and I have a, another close friend from India lives around the corner. We walk our dogs together and um, he was stolen as a math professor from Cal Poly San Luis. Abispo, I just get the impression that uh, PhD in math was a big deal for, for him to um, uh, be hired by them. So, um, yeah. what do you think the major constraint is? So we mentioned this before, student loans? I think student, yeah, uh, for our domestic students, uh, student loans, of course, you know, we have to continue to improve our uh, K through 12 education as well to prepare students for college. But uh, for many, many students, it's the financial barriers that are the big hurdle. Uh, in, and in everything from community colleges to graduate school, uh, these are factors. Remember, besides our advanced scientists and engineers, we need high quality technicians, electricians, uh, people of that sort who play a critical role in our science and technology uh, environment. So, um... We're going to take a break. We've been talking with Arthur Bienstock, who uh, has an amazing range of background in science policy. And we're going to start off with um, 
in 30 seconds hearing why we even need to worry about science policy. Um, so hang on and uh, be with us. So we'll be back in 30 seconds. The different therapeutic methods that we can help our um, very low socioeconomic status um, clients who have no alternatives, no, no anything, and they, there's still about 15 different resources we got out of this that if you have no resources, resources no service connection, you can still get aid. That they are connected, one encourages the other and that the process of change from backing off from the tobacco is the same as backing off from any other addictive drug. Everyone can benefit from this training that we just were offered today. I would not take it back. Welcome back. This is Environmental Concerns by Breathe California. We're talking with uh, Arthur Bienstock, a semi-retired Stanford professor who's uh, been a national expert in science policy. Um, I don't think there's too many of us that vote for a president thinking that he's going to have something to do with science policy. Um, why should we have uh, national um, involvement in setting science policy? Well, if you think about it, uh the means to protect our environment depends on science and engineering technology advances as well as advances in social science that help us to um, get people to behave in a manner that protects our environment similarly our economy is highly dependent on science and technology the things that we've come to take for granted, computers, uh, smartphones, and the like, also depend on having a strong science and technology uh, environment and people. Um, national security depends on the uh, good science and good scientists and engineers. So. Uh, a lot of what we need in the country depends on having strong science and a strong science and technology workforce. It seemed to me um, when I worked for uh, as a political appointee <laughs> in national EPA that um, we had very little engagement um, outside of the agency and our research agenda. Um, tell, tell me a little bit about um, what roles OMB and the policy office have, if anything in um, individual departments or agency science budgets. Okay. Uh, first of all, let me remind your listeners that, that science in the United States is supported by many different agencies. The National Science Foundation has the direct responsibility for supporting research in fundamental science, ranging from the social sciences through the physical sciences. But other agencies like EPA, uh, the Department of Energy, the National Institutes of Health, NASA, justice, they all support scientific research. And it's very valuable to the country that we have these different approaches to science because things that might not be of interest to uh, staff and reviewers for the National Science Foundation are very important to the Department of Agriculture or the Department of Energy. So we get these various viewpoints. Typically, um, the agencies first construct budgets that they want the president to support. Uh, and they submit those reports, those proposals. They have guidance from the Office of Management and Budget on how much money they can put overall. Within the agency, 
the role of science is often dependent on the leadership of the agency. Uh, some agency leaders have been very strong on science. <laughs> I think, for instance, of Ernie Moniz and uh, Steve Chu is head of the Department of Energy. Other leaders have emphasized other things that they thought were more important. Even within the Department of De Defense, which is a major supporter of research, some years they've got to focus on armaments and on increasing the number of military personnel. Other years they see the importance of more research. So it depends on the leadership. At any rate, the agencies submit proposals for their budgets to the Office of Management and Budget. The Office of Management and Budget, like all political bodies, has to balance uh, how important are increases for science against uh, social welfare programs, national defense, and the like. So they will go, go back to the agency with the so-called pass back, which indicates basically how much is the president prepared to support in the president's budget proposal to Congress. Um, and, and I have to say that at the last minutes, the last month or two, and if you're working in the White House, there's a lot of jockeying that goes on uh, as different people support the constituencies that they represent. They don't really represent them, but in fact, often do, like I was supporting basic science. Um, then the budget proposal goes to Congress and Congress has its own interests. Um, and, uh, you know, some are very concerned about the environment and will encourage uh, environmental research and, uh, and support for environmental remediation. Others are more interested in fossil fuel and and you have that competition within science. And, and again, it's the function of, of politicians to, to find some balance between the needs of science and other needs of the society and the needs of their specific constituents and the nation as a whole. So it's a messy process, but by and large, it works pretty well not always to my satisfaction. Uh, it's almost worrisome if it worked to the satisfaction of any one individual. Um, so one of the places that I noticed that you worked is the Wallenberg Research Link. What is that? Um, the Wallenberg Foundations in Sweden uh, are the uh, support a large amount of scientific and cult, uh, research, as well as cultural activities and activities in the humanities. But it's primarily uh, the sciences that concern the Wallenberg Research Link. They um, have a history of activities at Stanford University. They paid for several renovations of what we call Wallenberg Hall. Uh, that's one of the buildings right behind me in that picture. Um, they have supported collaborative research between Swedish and American scientists. And more recently, over the past half decade roughly, each year they send 10 postdoctoral fellows to Stanford to work with Stanford faculty for two years. Uh, and we at Stanford select the 10 from applications that are typically of the order of 30 or 40 applications of some of the brightest young people finishing their degrees in, Stan in Sweden. And uh, these fellows are highly valued by our faculty and then uh, a large fraction of them return to Sweden 
to uh, teach and do research in Swedish universities. So it's that program that we help manage at the Wallenberg Research Lab. So uh, that ties in with one of the things that um, you uh, talked about and thoroughly enjoying at a national level, which was trying to foster international cooperation in uh, science and technology. Yes. Um, it, I and a colleague, uh, Peter Michelson, for the past few years have been running a study for the American Academy of Arts and Sciences on international scientific cooperation. Um, our first report dealt broadly with international scientific cooperation and among other things, urged uh, the government to continue uh, scientific collaboration with China. China is actually our largest collaborator uh, internationally by far. And uh, to continue to attract students from around the world because our workforce needed it. Uh, and, and, and there are obviously other interests that feel differently. So there's tension within the government on this issue, but certainly the Office of Science and Technology re Policy received the report well. Our second report covered US participation in very large uh, international facilities like the CERN accelerator in, in uh, Switzerland and France. And uh, the third is it came out of left field in a certain sense, and it urges the government and higher education to uh, interact more strongly with countries that are emerging as scientific uh, participants. Uh, the global South largely, Africa, Southeast Asia, South America. And our reasoning is as follows. The biggest threats to America probably are not China or Russia, hopefully, uh, but instead infectious diseases and what I'll label broadly environmental degradation by climate change and the like. Certainly those are bigger threats to the nation than China represents. Um, yet a number of our policies plus COVID plus um, Chinese policies um, have made it harder to collaborate and also made students, it made it less attractive for students to come to the United States. We, you know, a large fraction of our students in engineering and computer science are Chinese. Uh, about 90% of them remain in the United States. So they're very important to us. And so Arthur, I apologize. Uh, our director's telling me to wrap it up. Um, so you and I could continue and maybe we ought to, we ought to soon. Um, but any last second one sentence messages or? Um, yes. If the nation is to have the science and technology workforce that is needed to protect our environment, keep us healthy, provide a strong economy and ensure national security, we must make higher education affordable for all our youth. At the same time, we must attract talented students, scientists, and engineers from around the world and make them welcome here. Thank you very much, Arthur. Um, this wraps up the show. Hope you'll see us next week. Thanks.